Um, it says uh, 92 1. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. Amen. So let's give thanks to the Lord for everything He ha have done for us and the cross. And let's go and let's sing to the Lord. And before that, we want to pray to start the service. Um, Heavenly Father, thanks for this day. Thanks for everybody who is here. Bless them in your name. Bless this service. And Holy Spirit, one, lead two, us one, two. in praise and worship to the Lord. And um, in the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Good morning, everyone. We want to worship the Lord this morning. Amen. That's what we came for, right? Amen. He's been so good to us, and and the Bible said that He created us to worship Him. Amen. And sometimes in the morning, when when it's rainy and cloudy, you know, I can still hear the birds singing. You know. And I said, Lord, I, I'm here out inside in my house, but these guys are outside, but they're still singing, you know. So praise the Lord. You got to be uh, happy, you know, for what we got and because we are here. Amen. So the ones that they can stand, with, we're going to stand up and we going to sing this song that's called Waymaker. Amen. Who you are 
Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, mending every heart. I worship you, I worship you. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Y that is who you are, 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 that is who you are. That is who you are. Even when I can see it, you working. Even when I can feel it, you working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I can see it, you working. Even when I can feel it, you working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I can see it, you working. Even when I can feel it, you working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, 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 that is who you are. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The next song we're going to play this morning, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Hallelujah. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. He pour out your power and love. 
As we sing holy, holy, holy To see you high and lifted up Shining in the light of your glory Pour out your power and love As we sing holy, holy, holy Jesus, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah.
This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. Your very word is spoken into me. for you and I'm lost without you moments to to talk to the Lord you, you talk to him with your heart you talk to him I don't know I don't know what you're going through I don't know we don't know how we came here this morning but he knows he knows what we need and if you open your heart You can tell the Lord, I said, I'm, I'm desperate for you, Lord. I'm desperate for you. I'm lost without you, Lord. You start to him this morning. Open your heart. Forget about what you left at home. I don't know if you're going through, through problems, through difficulties, but he knows. He knows what you need. And he's here this morning. He's here this morning. Probably you don't know how to solve problems, how to solve... I don't know what you're going through, but He knows. And He's here to help you. He's here to heal your heart. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God bless you. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, but worship team. Such a nice presence of the Lord's here, the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, we get to continue on with our worshiping the Lord through our uh, tithes and offerings. Woohoo! Can't get it up quicker than Pastor there, can we? Huh? Hallelujah. Amen. And um, welcome to those of you that are watching us online as well. And uh, you can uh, participate also by going to harvestchurchlive.org. 
and uh, clicking on the give link there and it'll walk you on through it and uh and uh so you can partake in god's uh blessings that he has for us that he tells us in his word hallelujah well i'm going to uh, start with deuteronomy fifteen ten. hallelujah and, and it tells us uh quite plainly to give generously to them and do so without a grudging heart then because of this the lord your god will bless you in all your work what a promise and in everything we put our hands to Amen. And in uh, Deuteronomy 16, 17, it says, Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessings of the Lord your God, which he has given you. Hallelujah. Such rich encouragement we are receiving there. Hallelujah. And um, and before we uh, uh, pray over the offering, I want to uh, present a, another opportunity to... Uh, so into the the ministry here, and um, uh, we are. I have a, a picture of the parking lot light in the back. If you could put that up, and uh, we are working on restoring this uh, light that uh, has not uh, worked for most of the years of the the church here, and uh, and so um, as you can see, the light is on during the day. And <laughs> it, it, it comes on for seconds, you know, and then it goes off and it does that. So at night it's dark. And if you've been here at night, that parking lot is very dark. Hallelujah. So we are working on um, uh, repainting it. We'll be doing that this Friday. And uh, anyway, the, 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 this is kind of an important project. And it's going to cost roughly that 900 to $1,000 by the time we're, we're done. We're going to have electricians they are going to put a new light on the top, a new whole fixture, and that'll be happening the week of the 8th. And uh, and so just there's an opportunity to, to, to sow into something very important for uh, for this uh, for this uh, church, for this ministry. And uh, so just put that on your envelopes if you like money to go towards the repairing of that light. And uh, hallelujah. So thank you very much. And uh, so... Heavenly Father, we just thank you for, we just thank you how you, you meet all of our needs personally and in the ministry. And we just uh, thank you, Father, for bringing forth unexpected income to fulfill all the needs, wants, and desires that we have both here and for the, for the church. And we just thank you for growing each one of us. And Father, we just sow these seeds and we plant and we believe by faith as if we already have it. And we just uh, Pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Todd. Well, we appreciate Todd's doing all the work on that as far as organizing it, and, and oh, Brian's helping too, so praise God. So thank you, Todd, for heading that up, and uh, appreciate it. Thank you, Mac, and... Jesse and Sir Pastor Servando and Pastor Lily for helping with the worship this morning. Praise God. Thank you so much. And we appreciate it. Yes, amen. They're going to be doing it next week too, so we appreciate that. Hallelujah. So um, a couple announcements. Ladies thing. We've got a women's um, thing this weekend. I don't know if, Joel, if you have that up there. Uh, Faribault Family Restaurant in the back room, 12 o'clock, first Saturday of every month for the ladies. The second Saturday is the men's breakfast, so men come out for that, and ladies come out for this one. Um, we eat lunch there, usually um, 12 o'clock, or you can just come for Bible study, whatever you want. Um, and then also, too, we have an open our, uh, a picnic, barbecue, grill, hamburgers, hot dogs um, on the 14th, which is two weeks from today, uh, at 1230. So right after the service here, we're going to our house at 7 Botsford Circle, and we're going to have grill out and have fun. And so every, everybody, if you would, what's that? Housewarming party, yeah, and picnic and barbecue. And there's a sign-up sheet out there. If you would just sign up your name, and then um, if you want to bring something like a dish to pass, we'll be, having hot, we'll be providing the hot dogs, hamburgers, cheese, and stuff. So um, just bring a, bring a dish if you would. All right. Thank you. God bless.
You guys, praise the Lord. What a blessing. What a blessing. Well, we're going to get into the Word of God this morning. Are you ready for it? Amen. Even if you're the only one here, and you're not, but if you were the only one here, God has a message for you. And with all of us here, He still has a message just for you today. Amen. So I've entitled again this morning, we're continuing on uh, with a personal message, a me- personal message from Jesus Christ out of the book of the Revelation. The Revelation. The Revelation of what? Well, look at the title in your Bible there. It says, The Revelation of Jesus Christ. So the book of Revelation is a revelation, an unveiling, a disclosure. I know we think it's just a disclosure of things to come, but it's also a disclosure, an unveiling, a revealing, if you will, of Jesus to us, and not only of him himself personally, but also uh, what he wants to say to us, not just for the future, but also for today, right now. And so you'll see that as we read a few verses here. So go to the book of Revelation. The Revelation of Jesus Christ is the title of this book, and that's what verse 1 starts out as, The Revelation of Jesus. We're going to be skipping down today to verse uh, 10 and 11, first of all. So we'll be reading that. Let's open up in prayer, first of all. Thank you, Lord, as we study your word. Holy Spirit, we welcome you to teach us the word of God today. Thank you that you are the great teacher. And Holy Spirit, I thank you that you reveal to us Jesus more clearly to each one and reveal unto us your will and your word. For our life today. And Lord, show us things to come, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Revelation chapter 1, verse 10 and 11 says, I was in the Spirit. Talking about being in the Spirit, with the Holy Spirit. Not some kind of evil worldly spirit, not some kind of evil spirit, or, or just kind of, uh, I'm in the Spirit. No, he says, I was in the Spirit you know, with the Lord, on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. So John was seeking the Lord. As he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And the Lord revealed himself to him. He gave him a vision. A vision of what? Well, verse 19. Verse 19, he says, Write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. He had a vision of Jesus, first of all. And that's what, you know, if we were to read on from where we left off in verse 11... He said, that voice that I heard, I turned to see that voice, and then here's what I saw. And then Jesus revealed himself to him in his glorified, uh, majestic, uh, resurrected body. You can read the description of there, and we did that in detail some weeks ago, and you can find that on the internet on our website. That past message there, A Personal Revelation of Jesus, was the title of that message. And... So that Jesus revealed himself. He says, John, write what you've seen. And so John wrote it down for us. And then in verse 19, he also said, and the things which are. He said, don't just write the things you see. Write the things which are right now. What things right now? Well, he's about, he's going to go on here and give a mess, messages to seven churches. I listed them off, right? But I want you to know it wasn't just to those seven churches that existed back then. We are still in the time of the things which are. There was the time that we're the times of uh, the things which are right now, as it says there in verse 19. And then there's going to be, he said, a revealing, and he wanted John to write down the things that'll take place after this. And that's what most people think of when they think of the book of Revelation. 
They think of uh, more than, you know, not necessarily, they miss, they miss a, that it's a revelation of Jesus. They think it's just a revelation of, you know, the Antichrist and the beast and 666 and the 144,000 and, you know, all those things that, you know, the vials and the, the, the judgments and all those things that will be taking place when the wrath of God is poured out. And that is part of the book of Revelation. But it's, first of all, if we get into us, you know, see a, a, a personal revealing, a personal vision of Jesus for our life, and then get set straight or get our focus on the things that are right now, how we're to live our life right now and what we're to do right now and what God wants for us right now, the things that are, then when the things that take place after all this uh, come to pass, we won't be in fear about any of it because we know that you know what, the main point of the book of, Re of Revelation as it reveals Jesus is Jesus is letting us know that we're going to overcome. We're going to overcome it all. Amen. Read the last few chapters of the, of the book of Revelation, which ends the Bible as we know it. As you read the last few chapters there, it talks about the great future that we have in store for us. Yeah, the world's going to go through some stuff. The world's going to go through great judgment and wrath and, you know, the Antichrist and the beasts and all those things. But there's going to be a great battle, the battle of Armageddon and all that that's going to take place. But guess what? We're going to win. We're going to come out on top. Jesus has already won. Did you know that? And he's coming back to this earth again. And he's going to come back and uh, demonstrate his ultimate defeat over the forces of evil. Amen. And uh, so that's what the rest of it's about, but we're right now still finishing up here, um, continuing on and probably going to finish today with the messages to the churches. Not just to those churches, but to you and I, because we are part of his churches. Amen. The church, if you will. The church is made up of many churches. And not only is the church made up of many churches, but also you are part of the church. You know, as you read the, the, the New Testament, you are part of the body of Christ, the church. You are one of the members, just like our body has different parts. Well, you're one of the parts of his church. You are the church. Amen. And so these messages to the churches are messages to you personally. He says in verse 3 of Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, it says, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keeps those things which are written in it. Written in it, for the time is near. You want to be blessed? I know you do. And he says, you'll be blessed if you read these things, hear these things, and keep these things, which means to do them. So... The message that he had for those churches is just as applicable to you and I today. They're for us today. If Jesus was standing here physically in the flesh, he would say these things to us today. In fact, there's three things that he said to every single one of the seven churches, which I know if he said it to them, if he was standing here, he'd say it to you. The first thing he said, I'll just give you the example here of where the first church of the church of Ephesus. In verse 2, chapter 2 and verse 2, he says, I know your works. You know, he said that phrase to every one of the seven churches. That means he's saying it to us today. Why would he single them out and not single you out? You're not an exception. I'm not an exception, right? If he knew their works, he knows, ooh, it's a serious thing to know. He knows my works too. He knows your work. But you notice when we think about that, we think, oh, he knows all my bad stuff. Well, he does. But you know, in this example I'm giving here, he doesn't just get right off when they're bad, what's wrong with them and what, you know, their bad works. He starts right off there with, he says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and then you cannot bear those who are evil. And that uh, you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored in my name's sake and have not become weary. He had a lot of good things to say to them, and he's saying that to you and I. God's not just looking for the bad stuff you do. 
He's looking for, all, you know, he, he knows all of your works, good and bad. Of course, he wants you to strive to always have good works, to be patient, to not grow weary, you know, to, uh, you know, keep laboring for the Lord and, uh, you know, not give up. And, and he goes on through the other six churches there and he has good things to say about most of, not all of those six churches. There's a couple of them there that he didn't have anything good to say about. But that's also a message to us. Make sure you have, you know, that God sees some, you know, some good, sees the good in you as well. Amen. But even those that he, you know, even those that he didn't see anything good about, he still, and he corrected them, told them how to get it turned around, told them how to get straight with him, and how to, you know, to 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 get back on track. And so that's what's contained here in chapters two and three. Those message, those messages to those seven churches, just take them as personal words from Jesus to you. And the first thing he said to all of them, and he's saying to all of us. I know your works. He knows what you do. That doesn't mean you're going to go to heaven. They don't determine whether or not you go to heaven as far as the works part. He just wants you to have good works, though. It's faith in Jesus that, you know, get, ob obtain our salvation. Faith in him and faith in him alone. Remember, I think we have it today for the screen over in Ephesians uh, 2 and verse 8 to 10. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, you can read it on the screen. It says, for by grace you have been saved through works. No, it doesn't say that, does it? For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And in case you didn't get it from there, it says not of works, the next verse says. It's not of works, because if it was, you could say, look what I did. I could boast about it. No, he says, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And then he goes on in verse 10, and he says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? We were created for good works. It's after you're saved, after you're recreated, after you're born again, that, that you know, the, work, the good works become important to, to God. He wants you, you know, it doesn't matter how many good works you have before you're saved. I mean, yeah, you sh we should always try to live right and be morally right and all that, all that stuff. But, you know, it's not to get, work our way to heaven. It's so that we can, you know, what we do, we put our faith in Jesus Christ so that we can continue on and good, do good works. God wants you to do good works. He works them in you, actually, where we're his workmanship. In order to do them, he works in us. It says, for good works which God prepared beforehand. God didn't prepare for you to do bad things, bad works. He prepared for you to do good ones. And so in these messages to the seven churches here, which is the Lord speaking to us today just as much as he speaks to us in uh, the verses we just read over in Ephesians. Yeah, he was talking to the church of Ephesus. That whole book of Ephesians is to that same church that he spoke to uh, in Revelation, the first church, the church of Ephesus. He's speaking to them, but they, he's also speaking to us right now, just like he said to them. It's not of, of works. It's by grace through faith that you're saved. And while he said it to them, he said it to all the others. It's just, he, you know, as far as works, he says, uh, you know, that he, he brought out their works. Good works and bad works. God's not just looking for the bad. He's all, he really gets pleasure in your good things that you do. And, he, and I, again, I read some of those here in the example of the first church, the, the good things that they did, how they were persevering and patient and, and uh, not putting up with uh, false, te you know, uh, those that said that they were, you know, uh, apostles and all of that. They checked them out. They didn't just take their word for it. They checked out things. How do you check out things, you know, whether to know whether they're of God or not? How do you know for sure? Well, the first step part of that is, does it line up with this? Does it line up with the rest of the Bible? Whatever, you know, the, that someone is saying, that's a word from God. And then the second way to know is the second thing he said to every single one of the churches. He said, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's given us the Holy Spirit to teach us, to, to guide us, to, to uh, guide us into what? Guide us into all truth. According to John 14 and John 6, uh, 14th chapter and John 16th chapter, again, that was past uh, a couple of weeks' messages. Uh, the second thing he said to every church, he said, if you have ears, hear what the Spirit is saying. He's not talking just about these ears, of course, but we do need to hear it with these ears. Uh, hear the Word of God. It's good to read the Word of God and hear it, and then he says, so you can do it and be blessed. But he's also talking about deeper ears, ears on the inside. You, you know, it enters the, into you through these ears into, so you can really hear it with your heart. Jesus spoke about that, you know, when he taught the parable of the sower. You know, he, was talking, he wasn't talking about planting seeds in land, you know, different types of soil in the parable of the sower that Jesus taught. We did look at Matthew 13 as one of the... Uh, versions of that, saint, that parable that he taught. He actually taught it in Matthew. He, there's a Mark's version of it, and then there's Luke's version of it, and uh, they all are, you know, they bring out different aspects of the, four, but they all talk about four kinds of soil. And then, you know, uh, Jesus' disciples came to him and said, Jesus, what are you telling us parables for? What do you, what do you teach in parables? You know, a parable is a story, an illustration. You know, his, and that his illustration, his story was about a farmer who plants seed in four different kinds of soil and what happens to that seed. And of course, he ends the uh, three types of soil where the, you know, the inferior soils or the soil that he doesn't want his word, plant, his word planted in or, or you know, the seed planted in. The fourth type of soil is what, you know, produces a good harvest, a great harvest. Hundredfold, thirtyfold, or a hundredfold, sixtyfold, and thirtyfold, it says in Matthew. Then it turns it around in Matthew, or in Mark, and says, you know, thirty, sixty, and a hundred. But uh, in any case, a harvest. He wants, you know, a harvest when seed is planted. The disciple says, Jesus, what do you, why do you talk that way? Why do you teach that way? Because... And then Jesus says, so that those who have ears to hear will hear. In fact, Matthew 13 and verse 9, again, that's from a past week. You can look that up, but, you know, on your own. In Matthew 13, 9, he says, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. A sower went out to sow seed. And then he taught the parable. Well, if they didn't have ears to hear, in other words, if they weren't listening from the in, on the inside to what the Spirit's teaching, well, then they just heard a story about planting seeds in soil, four different kinds of soil. And that's why the disciples said, why do you do that, Jesus? Of course, if you go back over there, Jesus answered them and told them why he does that. He says, so that those who have ears to hear and those who have eyes to see, he didn't just limit it to ears. He said, you've got to see it, not just with these eyes, not just, and not hear it just with these ears, but those that have eyes to see and ears to hear, if they really are hungry, if they really want to see, if they really want to hear, they'll understand. The Spirit will do, speak to them and teach them. And that's what the, Jesus said to every one of the seven churches. He said, he that has ears to hear about the messages that he spoke to each one of them. He said, hear what the Spirit is saying. And so that's what I want to encourage you in this morning, to hear what the Holy Spirit would say to your spirit, and more than just the, the words that you Read uh, the words that you hear, you know, also listen in your heart, and you'll understand. And that's really true about all of the Word of God. You know, we can just read it and just think of, you know, and think of it just as, you know, good stuff to read or history or, you know, get more knowledge. But God wants more than that for our life. He wants us to not, He wants us to hear it and to read it and hear it so that we get it down into our hearts. Hear it with our inner ears, if you will. The ears of our spirit. Our spirit, by the Holy Spirit teaching us deep on the inside what the Lord is saying. And you know what he says to one person from the same scripture, he may say something else from the same scripture to someone else. You know, just like that parable that he taught of the sower, the four kinds of seed, he said the first kind of soil is wayside seed. 
And that's the person that hears the word, and immediately the devil comes and steals it. He, he hears about how to, you know, to, hears about Jesus, hears about how to be saved. Jesus even said the devil comes and steal it, steals it so that lest they be saved. So they don't get saved. So they don't believe and get saved. And, uh, you know, that's the first kind of soil. Then he went on to, you know, the, thorn, or the uh, rocky soil, stony soil, depending on which, gospel, which, which, which one of the uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or uh, those uh, versions of it that you're reading. Uh, but he said it's stony soil or rocky soil. That's kind of, uh, that's not real deep soil. That's, that's soil where roots can't grow deep into because the rocks and the stones prevent it. And so that's the kind of liken in it to the person that, uh, whose heart doesn't let it get deep down in their heart. Oh, they like it when they hear it and they shout and shout hallelujah and they praise the Lord and they say, wow, that's good stuff. But then something happens to them out there. They get a pers- little bit of persecution. They get a little bit of troubles or they get a little something that co- trouble that comes against them and discourages them a little bit and they don't have deep roots, so they fall away. Quit serving the Lord. Quit, you know, uh, uh, you know, being excited about following Jesus. And then there's a third type of soil, which was the thorny soil, uh, you know, that chokes out God's word. You know, the the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the over, you know, wanting the stuff of this world so much, the lusts of other things, which is over desire for other things. The things of this world chokes out the Word of God. People get so wrapped up in the things of the earth and the things of this world. You remember I read last week, you know, the parable, uh, you know, the little track I read. It's a little man-made parable there of uh, the everybody's, the anybody's, and the somebody's, and the nobody's. You know, and it said something, uh, it started right off with, you know, somebody, want, somebody stayed home on Sunday. Somebody, you know, went fishing on Sunday. Somebody went visiting relatives on Sunday instead of worshiping God. They got caught up in the things of this world, in other words. They were the first kind of soil, that, or the second kind of soil, or the, actually it's the third, the thorny soil. They got distracted by the things of this world, and so then they can't produce a harvest. You know, if you don't get regular feeding from the Word of God, and I'm not talking about you get your regular feeding just at church, but it's a big part of it. I'll be honest, it's a huge part of it. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but maybe someone else is listening over the live stream that needs to hear that. We all need to hear it, though, and be encouraged in it, even if you're here today. Amen. So a regular feeding from the Word of God, and that's why I endeavor to put out a meal so big that you just leave full, over full, more than you can handle. You say, Pastor, why do you put up all those scriptures on the screen? You know, how can I understand, how, I can't get it all. You feel, at, but you can't, just take in as much as you can eat, you know, when you have a meal, you, you eat what you can, and then until you're satisfied, and move on, amen. And come back and do it again, and come back and do it again, and over, you know, you, you beca- stay healthy that way, and you grow, amen. Anyway, I don't know how I'm getting off on all of that, but having an ear to hear. The second thing he said to every church. So we're going to move on to the third thing today that he said to every single one of the churches. Let me give you the example here. Again, it's in to the church of Ephesus, but he did say it to every one of the seven. He said it in 2.7 to the church of Ephesus. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then he says, to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. After he said the second thing, he that has an ear to hear, then he went on to say, to him who overcomes. He said that to every one of the seven churches. He, ex- he said, and then he went on to list a reward for overcoming. Here in this example, to him who overcomes, overcomes what? Well, he listed some of the things above that. You know, he said that some say they're apostles, you've tested them, they're not. So they overcame some of that false, uh, you know, words from those that say they're, they're so great and so godly and they're really not. You know, they, they had to overcome some, per- they, it says they persevered and have patience. Uh, you know, lots of persecution, lots of troubles, lots of trials. Some things never change or have not changed yet. 
You know, they had troubles back then. Do you think we have troubles today? Well, of course we do. Serving Jesus isn't just a, you know, uh, a thing where you, you give your heart to him and everything becomes sweet and, you know, a bowl of cherries, so to speak. And everything just starts going good from then on forever and ever. And you just get to, you know, go to heaven and be with him. No, in the meantime, we're in this world. We're not to be of this world, but in this world, we're going to have tribulation. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. There's a scripture about that. Jesus said that. In this world, you're going to have some tribulation. But, you know, even though he wants us to overcome it. And that's why he says here, you know, they persevered. And, in fact, in the next... uh, the next church there, the church of Smyrna, I don't think I have this verse, but anyway, he's, when he talks about them, they were going through tribulation. That simply means tribulation just means troubles. And different degrees of troubles. There's going to be a great tribulation, you know, there's greater and lesser troubles, but we all have troubles, and they were going through troubles, and their troubles were, you know, uh, persecution, and actually even financial troubles that they were going through, probably because they were Christians, because they followed Jesus. Uh, you know, the rest of society was cutting them off, and they weren't able to, to get along financially and, and have opportunities like everyone else. And, but, you know, the Lord, even to that second church, the church of Smyrna, he told them, overcome it. Persevere in it. Amen. Because actually, that's not all there is about life. You know, just a little, uh, some persecution and troubles. That's not, the, Jesus is the, really the answer to everything. Amen. Whether things are going good or whether things aren't going so good, don't lose your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Overcome. Those things. And that's what he, say, he says to the, those churches. That's what he said to every one of the seven. That means he's saying it to you and I today. Overcome. Be an overcomer. Amen. Be an overcomer. And we're going to read some of the stuff that they had to overcome some things. You know, that first church there, again, we, we don't have time to read every one of the verses. But, you know, they were, they were going, you know what he told them to overcome there? He, he told them, you, you've left your first love. Get back to your first works, he said. Well, our first love is to be Jesus. Our first works are to be loving him. Loving one another, right? Well, they had somehow lost that somewhat. And so, you know, the Lord gave said to them, get back to your first love. Get back to the basics. Amen. Love me first. So they had to, you know, overcome that. Because, you know, the tendency is the, more, the longer you become a Christian, if you don't stay in the Word of God, stay in fellowship with God in prayer, and, uh, you know, in fellowship with His people, and in, in church, and all of that, Things kind of, you just kind of lose some excitement, lose some of the joy there. Did you know that? And when you do that, you kind of, what's described here, you're leaving your first love. You get distracted. That's how you begin those other kinds of soil, you know, where the cares of this world and, you know, the deceitfulness of, of money and riches and all of that. You get, you get uh, distracted by all of that and it replaces your love for Jesus eventually. Or at least it makes it colder. Anyway, so they had to overcome that. Then the next church, you know, they had uh, false teachers. You know, the next couple. So there's false teachers. You know not everybody teaches correctly the Word of God? That's why we need to stay in the Word of God to know when it's true and false, right? They had overcome false. They had to, and he told them to overcome that. Don't allow that. Don't, don't listen to that and take it into your own life. I mean, he says, you know, they, he talks about a couple of them, he talks about a phrase called the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Well, what's the deeds of the Nicolaitans? I, you know, when you read about these churches, uh, uh, you'll see that that's mentioned more than once. I think two or three of the churches, he said, watch out for the doctrine and the deeds and what the Nicolaitans do. So I said, what's that? I looked it up for you. The deeds of the Nicolaitans, it is... It, 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 it's, it's a teaching of uh, trying to mix uh, 
idolatry, trying to mix pagan things in with Christianity. Mixing and trying to mix things up. And they went so far as to even, uh, not, not just uh, some of the uh, uh, idol worship practices, but also even, you know, sexual immorality. And you know how the world excuses that even today. You know, like that's no big deal and all of that. Well, they were mixing all that in there. And, and he said, you got to overcome that. Just thought I'd throw that in. The deeds of the Nicolaitans and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, be an overcomer for, of all of that. So there was some false teaching about that. And then uh, another church, the church of Sardis, I think that starts in chapter 3, the first couple of verses. Look in chapter 3 and verse 1 and 2. I don't know if I have it for the screen, but I'll read it to you. And to the angel of the church in Sardis, these things says, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. In other words, he says, yep, people look at you and they think, wow, they're alive. Look at how flashy they are. They go to church all the time or they, you know, go to the big flashy church. You know, they have the big screens and the pastor wears his skinny jeans and they have the fog machines and, you know, and they have all that stuff and they, wow, they look alive. You see them on TV or on the internet. Wow, that's a big flashy thing. He said, this church, he said, you look like you got a big name, but you really don't. He says, strengthen the things which which remain. We got to overcome just trying to make a show of our life. We got to try to make it, try to uh, overcome. He said, overcome being a, trying to just be a showman, but be a sincere. Be sincere in everything. And I'm not saying just because of, you know, that flashiness that, you know, that people aren't sincere. But, but, in a, but it could be. It could be that same way, just in a smaller setting. Don't be a flashy just trying to show off about how spiritual and all flashy you are. He says you might have a big name, but he says you really don't. So they he said, overcome that. And we're going to read some of the rewards for overcoming those things here in just a few moments or a few minutes. Then there's another church, a church of Philadelphia. You know, he didn't have anything bad to say about their works. The Church of Philadelphia, Philadelphia is, uh, you know, that it, it referred to also as the Church of Love. Now, I'm not talking about the Philadelphia that, you know, that you, we know of in the United States or other towns. It's not a physical place here today, you know, that, uh, you know, uh, the very word means love. And, you know, there's a lot of love that still needs to, uh, to, to be re... Uh, how do I say it? There's a lot of love that still that people need to get back to in today's world, right? So just because you have a name doesn't mean it's there. But anyway, that church that he was writing to them and he's writing to you today, walk in love like the Church of Philadelphia did. And they were, you know, he said he also told them, he encouraged them that they were keepers of the Word of God. Oh, they were keeping the Word of God. And they've uh, not denied his name because it's easy to deny the name of Jesus, especially, or, you know, uh, uh, Christianity and, and the things of God. It's easy to, to make light of it and to deny it in today's culture, isn't it? Because, you know, you're going to get, a, you know, you might get some uh, persecution over it. Or somebody might make a bad comment to you about it or say that, you know, or, or, or say that it's not, you know, you got to watch you know, to not be so. Uh, while, or whatever the words they might use. Don't be so fanatical, and all those kind of things. Well, he commended them for keeping the word of God and not, you know, denying his name. And, but then he also said, you know, keep on going, overcome that, overcome, you know, the temptation to, to, to not keep his words and, the, and to deny his name, overcome that, and there's rewards for that. That he promised them, and that means there's rewards for you and I today. And then finally, the last church there, they had to overcome lukewarmness 
You know, it kind of leads in from what I was just speaking about. Lukewarmness, he says, you know, I don't want, I wish you were hot or cold. I wish I knew where, you know, that you would, you know, actually show where you stand. Not just be uh, lukewarm, he says, because you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. And then, you know, the phrase that he, the scripture that he, he, met, he talks about then is one, a lot of Christians know that. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and sup with him or have dinner with him and fellowship with him and all of that. He's not talking about, he's talking to the church there. He's talking to people of God there. You can become lukewarm. Don't become lukewarm. He wants you to overcome that. So there's a lot of things that, are, that, that those are applicable to each one of us today. Not just to the people, you know, people, churches in the past. They're to you and I today as a member of his church right now. Amen. So they had all kinds of challenges, all kinds of uh, obstacles, sins, tribulations and troubles, you know, adversities that they went through. But you know what? We have this, many of the same things today in our lives, right? There's various challenges, obstacles, sins, tribulations and troubles and adversities and fears and everything that try to come against us. Jesus wants you to be an overcomer. He said to he who overcomes. Or to some of the, well, some of the, three of the churches he said to he who overcomes. And to four of them he said to him who overcomes. The whole point of it all is he wants you to overcome. You're an overcomer. You know, as I said in the last service, I believe it was, I just was thinking about this last night. What's the opposite of overcoming? What's the opposite of over? Under. What's the opposite of coming? going. So instead of being an overcomer, I mean, instead of, you know, he, he wants us to overcome instead of undergo. So when you think of overcoming, it's more of an aggressive thing. It's doing something, not just be cowering and, you know, being in fear and just trying to barely make it or trying to just survive while all this bad stuff is happening around us, and while we're going through all these tests and troubles, and whatever adversity it might be that tries to, you know, the devil tries to throw our way, uh, he doesn't want you to just kind of, you know, sit it out, so to speak, and do the best you can to protect yourself. He doesn't want you to undergo. He wants you to overcome. Amen. Be an overcomer. Uh, you know, to overcome it, it's, that, you know, it has to do with being vi victorious and conquer things. Overcome them. Don't undergo them. <laughs> Amen. He that has an ear, let him hear. Let the Holy Spirit just speak to you about that. You know, because some people think, well, you know, I just got to try to do the best I can and kind of uh, hope I, I, I'm, I'm going to... Try to survive. I hope I can survive this. As if, you know, you have nothing to say about what comes against you. And, you know, I know, I understand things come against us for no reason. You know, that's because we're living in a cursed world still. One day it won't be. There's going to be a new heavens and new earth. And we're going to be, you know, we've got to read the rest, end of the book there to, to get all that. And what's in store for us later. But in the meantime, in this world, troubles are going to come. And, you know, and... and, and they just do. But we don't have to cower and just, you know, try to barely, just get aggressive about it and over, do, like he says, be an overcomer. Don't let it get you down. Amen. Go out against it, in other words, even. Kind of a militant term to overcome, just like conquer or victorious. You know, they all have to do with, with being an overcomer. And that's what God wants for his church. We're, we're to overcome and go out and be victorious. You know, um, how can we do that? Well, John 16, I think we have that scripture. John 16, 33. Look what it says about it. Jesus said, these things have I spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world... That's where we are now, right? We're also in Jesus, so while you're in him, you can have peace. And while we're physically, it says, in the world, you will have tribulation. 
But be of good cheer. Why? He says, I have overcome the world. And he's in us. He sent the Holy Spirit to be with us and to dwell in us and to fill us. Amen. Even though there's troubles and trials and tribulations in this world, he said, you can be of good cheer through it all. Why? I have overcome the world. And if he's overcome the world, he's made you an overcomer of the world. He had told every one of those seven churches there, and he's saying to every one of us today in his church, we are overcomers. Amen. And overcome all that. Hallelujah. He doesn't want you to stay stuck in it. Just barely getting along. You know, we're not victims. Did you know that? We're victorious and not, we're not the victim. Yes, the devil tries to make us the victim. He, he, he counts us as sheep to the slaughter, I think it says over, I think we have the scripture even. Romans uh, chapter 8, 35 to 39. What can overcome the, you know, what can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, you know, wars, or all of those things, can all these things over separate us from the love of Jesus, Him loving us, and us loving Him? You know, the implied answer is no. And in case you don't get the implied answer, He'll go on to say it. Look at the next verse. Verse 36. It says, as it is written, for your sake, Talking about God. For your sake, we're killed all the day. Some have that attitude. that You know, they think, well, Lord, I just follow you and I put up with it. And for your sake, I'm getting all this troubles. All the, everybody's against me. And all of that because of you. And oh, woe is me. But he says, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. You know, they think that we're just, you know, uh, you know weak and can't do anything about it. Look at the next verse. Verse uh, 37. He says, yet in all these things we are, it doesn't matter that these things come against us, because in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. The next verse, verse 38. He says, for I am persuaded, you got to be persuaded, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. Next verse nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate you from that. You're an overcomer. He says, overcome. Amen. Those same th things they were going through, those seven churches, they were going through those persecutions, those distresses, those times of famine, those times of, you know, being without. Those times of persecution and, you know, coming against them, and even imprisonment and even death. One of the churches there, he says, they're going to put some of you in prison and even some of you are going to die there. He says, but don't let it separate, you know, overcome it. You can overcome all of that. Amen. Well, I thought being a Christian was just going to be a fun little... It, it is the greatest thing in the world, and it is. If you have the, if you're persuaded that none of the, nothing that happens, good times, bad times, up times, down times, sideways times, whatever times they are, whatever happens, be persuaded that nothing will overcome you. You're going to be the overcomer because you are. Amen. A couple of other verses of scripture about that. First John chapter four. First John chapter four. That's right before, or just a few pages before the book of Revelation, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4. It says, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And those that, what he says, you overcome them, he's talking about the evil spirits in the world. And greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world. Amen. We've overcome them. Notice he said that? You have overcome them. Well, it doesn't feel like it to me, some people think. But that doesn't change it. As far as God is concerned, you're an overcomer. You have overcome them. Overco now walk it out. He's in you. Amen. In the world, you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. He's in you. 
Jesus said, I've overcome the world. He says, greater is he, in this verse, greater is he that's in you. Yes, there's things that happen. Yes, there's things that, you know, tempt us. Yes, there's things we face. And even by our own bad decisions, we go through some things and, you know, face troubles and stuff because of that. You know, but we have the greater one in us. We're overcomers. Amen. We're victorious. We don't have to just give up and quit. He said that to many of those churches, and he's saying it to you and I today. Persevere. Keep on going, in other words. Don't give up. Hallelujah. Over in 1 John chapter 5, in the same verse 4, 5, 4, he says this. He says, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Let me ask you a question. A question, are you born of God? Have you been born again? That, if you've been born again, if you've been saved, you've been born of, God, born of God, recreated by God on the inside, and he wants you to walk it out on the outside, be an overcomer. He says, he who is born of God, or whatever is born of God, overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. What, what overcomes the world? Faith. Trusting the Lord, believing in Him, being fully persuaded that, you've over, that he, he is in you and you've overcome. Let me tell you a little bit more, or let me show you a little bit more about that. Over in Mark chapter uh, 11, you know, Mark chapter 11, I'm gonna, you know where I'm going to the faith verses there. But there's some things I want to show you about that that are going to be a help to you. And a blessing concerning that. You know, it says in Mark 11 and verse 22. Mark 11, 22, it's Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. He's saying that to you and I today, because what overcomes the world? Our faith. Faith in what? Faith in you? Faith in me? No, faith in God. Have your faith in God. And if you have faith in God, well, what's that all about? Do I just have to believe? Well, that's part of it. Certainly, faith involves believing. It involves what you say. It involves what you do. But it also involves some things that a lot of people leave out about overcoming by faith. And that's what these verses talk about. Let's go to the next verse, verse 23. He said, For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things that he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. I know that, Pastor. All I got to do is believe. I got to say it. I got to speak it. You know, some people, some Christians think, I, I, I know, you know, I've learned the faith scripture here, and I, I just got to speak to that mountain and tell it to be removed and not doubt in my heart, and it'll go. And that's all part of it. Yes, that's true, but there's more to it. Let's keep on going. He goes on to say this in verse 25 or 24. Whatever, whenever you stand, or therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, there's some praying involved, asking, when you pray, believe you receive, when, ask when you pray and believe you receive them and you'll have them. Oh, I just thought I had to believe and I receive them and that's it. No, he said pray and believe and receive it. Amen. So whatever you ask for, when you pray, believe you receive them. Some people don't get what they, ask, what they want because they don't ask. That's what prayer is about. Then we've got to go on, and that's not all there is to it. I mean, it's simple, but there's, there's, it's not just any one thing. All, you know, believing in God, having faith in God is, you know, uh, several different aspects involved in that. Whenever you stand praying, he said, if you have anything against anyone. Yeah, we're to pray, and then when we pray, if you have anything against anyone, what are we supposed to do? Forgive them. Remember the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, that your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those. Forgive us our trespasses trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That's sins. He says uh, in verse 25, 25, he says, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them, 
that your Father in heaven may also forgive your trespasses. That sounds like the Lord's Prayer, doesn't it? Right in line. He says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. If you want your faith in God to be able to overcome the world, make sure that when you stand praying, you have no, nothing that's uh, ill will towards anyone. Forgive. Don't hold grudges against anyone, he said. Just like, you know, as your, that your Father in heaven may forgive your trespass, your, your uh, trespasses, and then in the verse, next verse, makes it even clearer. But if you do not forgive, you're in trouble. I'm just summarizing it. Read it. If you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. You're in deep, you know, deep trouble there. It's all part of it. You say, well, I just got to believe and confess and receive and ask and all. And God just, he wants the best for me and that's all there is to it. He says, no, you got to love. Love me and love your neighbor as you love yourself as well. You can't hold grudges. You got to forgive just like I've forgiven you. Amen. Well, I hope you're still glad you came to church today. You want to be an overcomer, don't you? That's a personal word from Jesus. He, you want, he wants you to overcome. Okay, let's look at some of the rewards for overcoming. I'll just list them off. Most of these scriptures we don't even have time to go to, and even if we did, I didn't put it on the list on purpose because I knew it would be too time-consuming, and you know we can only digest so much. But I'll quote some of them. If you want to follow along with me, though, over in Revelation 2 and 3, that's the message to the seven churches. I'm going to read the verse talking about uh, where he, the verses where he, uh, the message uh, from the verses that he says to them to overcome and their rewards for overcoming. Over in 2 7, he says, if to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Tree of life, paradise of God. Sounds great, doesn't it? It's a reward. Let the, if you have ears, Talking about ears, let the Spirit, what the Spirit is saying to you about that. The tree of life, sustenance from God. Anyway, verse 11. Uh, verse 11, he says, He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. That's a good thing. You know, there's two deaths. Did you know that? Well, there's two deaths not for everybody, there's two deaths for some. If you're a follower of Jesus, if, you, if you're a believer, if you've given your heart if, to Jesus and you're saved, there's only one death. And if Jesus returns before you die here in our lifetime, you don't even get to part of the first death. But should that not happen, you know, we, we only participate in the first death. If, you know, we're still, if Jesus hasn't come by the time we get to that time in our life when, you know, our time is done and we die. And, but even that's not bad because we, that death means we just go to heaven. You just leave, and, you leave your body and go to heaven. And, you know, catch, your body will catch up with you later, okay? And a, res, a resurrected body will, you know, be taken up in the rapture. <laughs> Amen. It'll, it'll catch up with you, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, it'll, kept up, it'll, kept, it'll catch up to you in a different state, in a glorified state. It'll catch up with you in a perfect state. Amen. Anyway, so um, you'll not be hurt by the second death. The second death, that's spoken of here in the book of Revelation. It's over in Revelation chapter 20. You can read out about it in uh, verse, uh, around verse 14 or 15. It's called the lake of fire and brimstone that the devil and his, and his demons are going to be cast into, you know, and they're going to be thrown into the f lake of fire and brimstone, and it says, which is the second death. That's the second death, is the lake of fire. And then in 21.8, he says, I'll read 21.8, just because I have my uh, revelation open here. 21.8, he says, but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, Sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So the second death are for those who are, you know, for make that list. The unbelievers, the abominable, the uh, 
abominables. Okay. That's not a snowman. <laughs> anyway, here, the unbelieving, the murderers, all those things, the liars, and those that haven't repented, in other words. You know, if you haven't repented, uh, you know, those sins that don't in and of themselves disqualify you. It depends whether you've repented of those sins and decided to follow Jesus and turn around from all of that. Amen. But those that haven't get the second death. Anyway, so our great reward for him who overcomes that we read here. To the church of Smyrna, he's talking to the church, to you as well. You won't be hurt by the second death. Praise the Lord. Over in Revelation 2.17. 2.17, here's another reward. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Now, I don't know what all that entails, and there's, symbol, there's some symbolism there, they, Bible scholars say, but that's why Jesus said, he prefaced that with saying, he that has ears, let him hear. What is the Holy Spirit saying that to, to you? Hidden manna, that's bread from God, food from God. Amen. You know, the white stone, I don't know what that's all about exactly, but some scholars say back in history, back in, you know, way, way, you know, centuries back, and maybe even thousands of years back, a white stone was something, had something to do with being uh, acquitted of crime, you know, it was written on a white stone or something like that. You know, um, it has, has to do with you being acquitted, not being charged with your crimes, you know, and things like that. So there's some good rewards there for overcoming. And then the next one is uh, 26, 226. Here's a reward for, for overcoming. He says, he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. There's going to be some power, some authority, some job to do in heaven. You're going to manage something. Say, well, I don't want a bunch of power, but you know, he's going to give you some authority. That's what that power is talking about. It's just you're going to manage something. We're not just going to lay around and eat grapes all the rest of eternity. You know, he's got something for us to do all throughout eternity. Verse 28, uh, he says, and I will give him the morning star. What's the morning star? Well, you got to go back to the end of the book. Jesus himself even said in the 22nd chapter, I'll read a verse to you. He said in 20, uh, 22, 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify these things to you, to the churches, or in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. If you overcome, I mean, Jesus, he says you, you get to place with the morning star with Jesus. Come on. Be an overcomer. Don't give up. Don't go back. Don't backslide. Don't fall away. Be an overcomer. Amen. And then we'll, the other, we'll finish it off here with the chapter 3 and verse 5. If you overcome that reward, that for overcoming is, it says, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. I will blot his name. I will not blot his name out from the book of life, but I'll confess his name before my Father and before his angels. I mean, there's a lot being said there. We could talk for the next, you know, hour or two about that. Not being blotted, you know, you're in a book. Did you know that? And if you overcome, you're not blotted out of the book. You know, not, you want you to overcome, you know, and not fall away and all that. So anyway, there's, there's that that's spoken of. And you can read more about that the last few chapters of Revelation, that the, last, the great white throne judgment, that's when the book's coming out. To those who are already destined to go back to the lake of fire, to hell. But anyway, the book's coming out, and, you know, uh, just to show them their name's been blotted out. Anyway, he says, I'll not blot out your name. And, you know, the white garments, a sign of purity and righteousness and all of that. Then we go on to verse 12, 312. There's another rewards that are spoken of there. It says, to him who overcomes, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more, out of God's presence no more, in other words. 
That sounds great. Wonderful reward. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. I don't know what all that's about, but I do know this. You've got an ear to hear. Let him say, hear, what this, hear what the Spirit says to you about all of that. Amen. But it's good because it's all good stuff here. Now, let, and then I'm going to finish off here in verse 21. Is that the last reward that he brings out, speaking to his church and speaking to us, his church. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Again, a throne is a place of authority. And even if it wasn't, you're still sitting with Jesus. Come on. You're still right there with him. You get to be with him forever and ever and ever. That's a great reward to him who overcomes. Be an overcomer. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for making us overcomers. Thanking us that you have already made us an overcomer. And we have already overcome because you've already overcome on our behalf. And you filled us with your spirit. Spirit, Holy Spirit, I thank you that you give us power. Power to be a witness, but power to also overcome anything that comes our way. So, Lord, my prayer for each and everyone here today and everyone that's watching or listening to this all over the Internet, over the live stream, or however they're hearing this and re, or watching this message today, Lord, that we get hold of and deep down into our hearts, be fully persuaded we have overcome and we're going to overcome. Will not let anything stand between us, Lord, and what you would desire for us. Serving you, loving you, trusting you, and living for you. I pray, Lord, all the days of our life. And if you've never made a commitment to the Lord Jesus, I pray that you'll make that commitment today. The Lord wants you to commit your life to him. Commit your life to him by just calling on him and asking him to save you. If you do that, he'll do it. That's what faith is, asking and believing in Jesus. I should say even stronger than that, believing on Jesus. Put, throwing your whole life on him. He wants all of your heart and all of your life. Just call out to him from your heart in prayer, and say, Jesus, save me from all of my sins. Save me from the penalty of the sins that I have ever committed. I repent of my sins. I repent of my past life. I repent of trusting myself. And I trust you now from this moment forward. I'm yours. I commit my life to you. I can't do it on my own. I need you, Lord. I believe you died for me to pay the penalty of my sins when you went to the cross, that your blood washed away all of my sins, and then after you died and rose again, so that I'll rise again, and do rise again now, and get a home in heaven eternal. Thank you for forgiving all of my sins, saving me from them, and giving me a home in heaven forevermore. I'm yours from this moment forward. I trust you. I believe in you, and I'm yours. Jesus' name, I'm yours. Help me, Lord, to serve you. Amen. You pray a prayer like that out of your heart, just he knows your heart. And he saves you. Let's all stand, shall we? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. To he who overcomes, he's got good things in store for us. This is the victory that has overcome the world. Faith and trust in him. And remember, that means walking in love as well. Praise God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. Look upon you with his favor and give you peace. God bless you all. There's coffee and snacks there. Fellowship. If you want prayer, do come forward for prayer. We'll make sure we pray with you and for you. So we're going to dismiss formally, but God bless you all. Have a great and wonderful day. You're an overcomer.
and have a great week and a great life in Jesus. Over.